Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, class, the Baby Boomer class. Uh, we are so glad you are here. Even though you're not here physically, you're here spiritually and visually. And we're so glad you're here. Uh, we have a, uh, if you're listening to us for the first time, or maybe this video's been shared with you by a friend or a classmate, uh, we, we invite you to our class. We meet at 11 o'clock when we're here in the church when it reopens. We all go to the worship service first and then go to our class second. So anyway, we're so glad you tuned in. Hope you're going to learn a lot. <clears throat> I'm here with Laurie. Laurie's my perfect attendance classmate. She's been to every single video and audio class since the virus took over. And uh, we're hoping and praying that'll end in the next month or so. We'll see. But anyway, we're trekking behind Andy as he progresses through the Bible, the Old Testament. And so we're going to spend the lesson today in 1 Kings. And we're going to talk about Elijah. Uh, the title of this is Elijah, the Mighty Man of God, is Human, too. And that's exactly what we're going to see today. So I want to welcome you and thank you for, for tuning in. Um, we also have an email list. So if you're not on my email list, you need to find my email and uh, send me an email so I can attach. I send an email out every Wednesday to my class, 120 emails, and uh, I attach the class notes. Yes, we actually have class notes. And also, now I'm attaching uh, my talk by YouTube, and also Don Rose, who is our, our class minstrel. He and Jay sometimes sing together, but Don sings a song usually an appropriate song for the class. And it's usually not uh, necessarily a Christian song. It could be a secular song. So anyway, if you want to get an email, just let me know, okay? All right, we're going to open in prayer and get into Elijah, the mighty man who is also human, okay? Lord, thanks for today, and I pray that you would open our minds and hearts to realize that even mighty men, powerful heroes of God, are also human and flawed and can can get exhausted. And today, I pray that the Spirit, your Spirit, would teach us lessons in uh, resting and relaxing in you and your will. And uh, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you remember a few weeks ago, Andy taught on uh, Elijah being called uh, and confronting uh, 850 people idol priest and he, and one, the half were from Baal, the idol Baal and the other half uh, represented Astra and uh, if you remember the story uh, he mocked them, he, he told them to make an altar and pray all day long to Baal to start a fire and, and burn the sacrifice and he laughed at them and joked with them and then finally he said you're ready to see some fireworks now and he prayed and God sent down fire, and blew the water out and steamed it off and burned the sacrifice. And then <clears throat> Elijah <clears throat> killed, slaughtered, literally killed uh, those 400 and some priests. And so he's been a busy guy. He was just a farm guy. God called him to be a, a prophet and he had to confront uh, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel who are two of the most evil human beings on the planet. And uh, so he, he, was, uh, he was a busy guy. He, he raised uh, a woman from the dead, a woman's son from the dead. He was, he was a go-getter, <clears throat> prophet of God. But he also lived a pressure-packed life. And so after all these things he did, we'll, we come to chapter 19 of 1 Kings. That's where I want you to turn. And we're going to split this chapter in two. And, and read what happened after this incredible journey he went on and all this stuff he did for God, his mighty works. He, he became a human being again. And it's very interesting. We're going to learn a lot about being a human being today. And being a human being means sometimes you can't be on top of your game all the time. So I'm going to, I'm going to have Laurie, my wife, come up and read the first eight <laughs> verses of chapter 19 of 1 Kings. I'm going to read from here. Oh, Laurie. Laurie's sitting down in the class. Yeah, I'm comfortable. Notice we have cushioned seats now. Comfortable seats. Okay. I'm moving this to the class. 
Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So <clears throat> picture this, you know, he just, he just had this incredible experience with, it was he, he by himself against 400 and some Baal priests, and God brings fire down, and then he kills all the priests. <clears throat> you talk about an emotional experience and an exhausting experience. But in the first chapter of first, or first verse of First Kings chapter 19, it says, Now Ahab told his wife Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, I'm going to take your head off. You're going to die by tomorrow night. And Elijah freaks out. He had been so bold. And all of a sudden he, he runs. He runs for his life. And it's interesting to see what, what God did when he was totally afraid and running. In verse 3, he's running for his life. He came to Beersheba, and he left his servant. And then he went a day's journey into the wilderness. So it's like he goes down I-40 for 100 miles, and he gets to an exit, and he, he says, uh, I'm, I'm at a rest stop. I'm going to want my servant to stay here. I'm going to walk into the woods about three miles away from everybody. And it's interesting where he went. He went to the wilderness, and he requested for himself that he might die. He asked God to kill him, basically to kill him. He said, it's enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. He felt like a failure to the point he was, at, he was saying, God, I've had it. We've heard this uh, prayer before when Moses got mad at the Jews for their continuous rebellion, and he asked God to take his life one day. He said, God, the people you gave me are crazy. I, I hate this job. Just kill me. And God said, uh, no, I'm not going to kill you. So we see um, really great men of faith and women of faith that finally come to the end of their emotional rope, and they just ask God to kill them. And so <clears throat> it's interesting. Uh, the final thing he did was pray. And God, God said, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to feed you, and I want you to sleep. Interesting. So anyway, um, it, it reminds me of what Oswald Chambers said in his book, My Utmost for His Highest. He said, we tend to pray at the last resort. So, you know, first he runs, he's afraid, he's, he's desperate, he's in despair. And, and finally he says, um, God, kill me. But the prayer was the last thing he did. He didn't pray first. He ran first. And that's exactly what we do. Now, it's interesting. You, you ask the question, how can this be possible? In General MacArthur, famous World War II general, said this, there are four things that we need for success. And here they were. We, we need the will to win. We need strength and power. We need an adequate supply. And then... We need knowledge of the enemy. And, and Elijah had all of these things at his disposal, but what crushed him? What, what in the world crushed him and made him so discouraged? So let's look at that. 
in, in, in point two in your outline, it, I listed the things that probably influenced him in a negative way. The first one was exhaustion. The second was losing focus. The third was the enormity of the task, humanly speaking. And then, <clears throat> this one's odd, but it was probably too many emotional wins, too many victories. And we're going to talk about all four of these. So let's look at exhaustion first. Exhaustion, today we call it emotional burnout. But no God's solution. It was sleep, eat, and then sleep again. And so we think it's a spiritual problem. A lot of times when we're so frustrated and tired, we think there must be something wrong with us spiritually. God goes, no, I actually made you this way. I made you to function spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and by the way, mentally. And a lot of times you can solve a spiritual problem with physical rest and good food. Did you know that? Did you know you're that connected? Did you, do you know when uh, terrorists uh, uh, torture people? You know what they use a lot of time? Sleep exhaustion. Sleep deprivation can make you crazy. It can make you lose your mind. It can also affect you spiritually. And a lot of times, we're just too busy running around doing spiritual things, we forget. God's trying to get us to relax, rest, sleep, eat well. And so we don't think of that. But I, I, will, <clears throat> I will tell you this, that God made angels, and angels don't need to sleep, and they never rest. They're awake 24-7. But you're not an angel, and I'm not an angel either. So we need rest, and we need it to protect not only our physical well-being, but our mental and spiritual well-being. So don't forget that. Grinding out the Christian life, even if you're grinding it out and having success, usually leads to failure and exhaustion. Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. He says, having you, you Galatians, are you foolish, he says, having begun by the Spirit? Are you trying to grow using the energy of the flesh by following the law? That's a paraphrase. But what he's saying is, you came to Jesus by faith. You don't try to live the Christian life by the flesh. You're just going to get exhausted. And so, that's the first thing. Um, I, I, some of you know, I used to be a wrestler. And, and if you've never wrestled, you, you have no idea what a, a six-minute high school match or an eight-minute college match or uh, a nine-minute international match feels like. But you're dead. You're, you're, you're giving 100% in a very short period of time. The worst thing to happen is to go into overtime if you're a college wrestler. You go into overtime... Then it's one-minute periods until somebody wins. And there's a point in time where you're so exhausted, you don't care who wins. You don't care if your girlfriend and mom are up in the sands. You don't care about your teammates. You don't care about the wolf pack. You don't care about anything. You just want off the mat. And so you, you lose your sense of reality when you're exhausted. So remember that. Maybe some of you are grinding out your Christian life and you feel tired. How about a little R&R? &R? I mean... The, the virus is giving you a not lot of R&R, &R, and some of you are not even used to that, but take advantage of it. The second thing I think happened was losing focus. <clears throat> he, he wants to die because he thinks he's alone. He's the only one, well, <laughs> I wonder why I thought that, because he's the only one that runs up and confronts Ahab and Jezebel, and he was the only one at the big priest fire uh, uh, at the altar. Um, but, but I want to remind you that losing focus is, is very normal. Um, even the trick of the devil, in your outline, I mentioned this. That Satan, the word, the, the, he's called the accuser. And um, here's what he might say to you. Revelation 12.10, he's called the accuser. Here's, here's the voice that he says. He whispers to you this. You're on your own with God. You sometimes fail. And God is so disappointed in you. And he'll probably punish you for it as well. How many times have you thought that when you failed or, or when things are going wrong? You tend to, to, to focus on blaming God. And uh, you lose the focus of God's grace. I've talked to two people this week, happened to be two ladies, that were struggling mightily in their marriage. And um, I just told them, 
Don't lose your focus. This is cha- a chapter in your book. There's going to be another chapter later. And God's in charge of everything. Uh, losing focus can really hurt you dramatically. Remember Peter when he, when he was out in the boat and Jesus walked on the water and Peter said, can I walk? And he went out and walked on the water. And as soon as he noticed the wave coming and looked away from Jesus, he sunk. <clears throat> and, and as Dr. Howard Hendricks said, Peter paid, prayed the shortest prayer in Scripture. Save me. <laughs> Save me, Jesus. I'm drowning. But the point is, it's easy to lose your focus. <clears throat> Sometimes you're losing your focus when you're comparing yourself to other people. I remember a few years ago, I looked at the top 100 uh, prize money in professional golf. The number 100 guy had made $125,000 that year. So now you can look at that two ways. How many of you would love to be playing a game that you love, golf, every day out by yourself and having fun with people and competing in tournaments and practicing and make 125000 That's not bad. That's 10000 a month. Not bad. But if you looked at yourself as the 100th best golfer in the United States, you would say, that's horrible. There's 99 golfers better than me. So a lot of times it depends on how you look at yourself. What do you compare yourself to? So be aware of that. Be alert. And uh, it's a dangerous place to be. The other thing is, uh, when you lose focus, you can, you can have despair. So beware of despair. Uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks, again, I'm going to quote him. He says, discouragement is, the, is leukemia of the soul. I love that. It's a slow burning sensation of your soul. So don't let yourself get into despair like Elijah did. Now I'm going to read the the next verses starting in verse 9 of 1 Kings 19. It says, Then he came to a man cave and lodged there. I actually threw in the word man. But what what do men do when they get discouraged or they want to get out of, just forget it. They go to the man cave. So sure enough, Elijah goes to the man cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Uh, and he, <clears throat> what did God say? He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I'm sure he said it with that attitude. What the heck are you doing here? Now, let me ask you a question. If God's omnipotent and omniscient, did he know where Elijah was? Of course he did. But he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And um, uh, Elijah said in verse 10, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I mean, isn't that a great little sermon? Like, God, uh, have you noticed that your people don't follow you? Have you noticed that I'm the only one at the altar with a Baal pre- uh, idol priest? Uh, I'm the only one here, and now, you know, Queen Jezebel has taken my life after me and wants to kill me. Now, now let me ask you this. Um, sometimes it's the enormity of the task you're doing. That's what throws you into despair. So let me, let me talk about that. <clears throat> um, when he said, I'm, I alone am left, and they're going to kill me too. They want to kill me. Uh, that, that's a good sign of of your giving God information that he already has. Um, you don't need to do that. Um, when God asked him, why are you here? What are you doing here, Elijah? You know why he asked him that? Because Elijah had traveled 300 miles away from Jezebel and, and spent 40 days on the road. And God's like, what are you doing here? You're, you're, you're leaving your assignment. And so whenever... Whenever you start giving God instructions about your situation, that's a pretty good signal that you're thinking about yourself. <laughs> Woe is me, for I am undone. Right? So be aware that when you, when you start complaining and giving God information that He already knows, that's a good signal you're not focusing on Him and His calling. You're focusing on yourself. So <clears throat> Elijah gave God all, about, all the information about himself. Uh, and, and so what did, what did God do? 
verse 11 of 1 Kings 19. So he said, God said, go forth and stand on the mountain before God, Elijah. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountain and breaking the pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Now after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face uh, with his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And below, behold, a voice came to him a second time. <laughs> what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down, torn down your altars, killed the prophets, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he, so it's almost like conversation number two. I'm alone. I'm the only one doing the job for you, God. And now they're going to kill me. So after two conversations, basically saying the same thing, God starts answering him by saying, here's what I want you to do. Now, I, I, I want you to remember, too, that sometimes the bigger the task and the more successful you might be, the worse the emotional drop-off after that is. So sometimes the bigger the task, the bigger the fall emotionally. And so that can affect you, too. It reminds me, you know, Andy will like this. He's a big Ohio State fan. But when Urban Meyer was coaching the uh, University of Florida, he had a quarterback by the name of Tim Tebow. Not a bad quarterback. He won the Heisman Trophy. A really neat Christian, if you remember. But after uh, a few seasons at Florida, uh, there's a great story in Sports Illustrated a few years ago about how he became exhausted and almost mentally went off off balance and he had to go to a hospital and be secretive about it and people found out then he finally retired from florida took two years off and came back and went to ohio state to coach there for a few more years but <clears throat> the point i'm making is urban meyer told his story that he grew up with a father who wanted perfection he wanted him to be successful in everything and he was pretty demanding. And so he was admitting that his childhood environment had affected him and how he coached and what he did. And he was very successful. But after those amazing success stories, winning the National Football Championship twice, he fell off the deep end for a while. And what did he need? Rest, food, relaxation to get his focus off himself and his victories and his inner pleasing my dad every time I do something story. So I'm just saying to you, maybe there's things in your background and family that cause you to feel discouraged. And sometimes you just need to take a break, get with the Lord, relax, listen to his word, and notice that God revealed himself to Elijah with mighty power, earthquake, big wind, fire. But then it says the last thing he did was he, he heard the sound of a gentle blowing. Or could that be the Holy Spirit just saying, Elijah, why are you here? What are you doing here? Everything is fine. Don't you understand that? <clears throat> so the next thing the Lord did was he gave him some assignments. He said in verse 13, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 15 of, 1 Kings 19, the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you've arrived, you shall anoint Haziel, king of Armin, or Aram, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehilo, you shall anoint the prophet in your place. It shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu, shall, shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall be put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So <clears throat> what is God saying here? He said, he said look, 
you, you think you know everything, Elijah, but you don't know half the stuff that's going on. I'm going to have you go anoint two new kings. I'm going to let you anoint Elisha, who is going to be your second in command. I'm going to allow you to delegate responsibilities to him so that you're not carrying the burden all by yourself. And then I love the other thing he says. And oh, by the way, there are still 7,000 other people in Israel that have not bowed a knee to Baal and worshipped him. Remember Elijah told him two or three times, I am alone. I alone am, am left. And God says, you and 7,000 other people are left. Hello, wake up. You think you're by yourself. Another trick of the enemy. The enemy is always saying, you're the only one who sins like you do. You're the only one who disappoints God. Everybody else around me that's a Christian, looks like they're always happy. But I'm not. And, and the devil goes, yeah, you're alone. It's all, you know, you're a scumbag. You're never alone. There's always a remnant. God talks about the remnant in the Old Testament. So after all of this idolatry for years and years in the kingdom, 7,000 people were still believers in, in God. So anyway, <clears throat> don't, don't forget that. Uh, you're never alone. You don't have to be discouraged. So God took care of the exhaustion by rest, giving him rest. God took care of the focus by reminding him that it's not all about you, Elijah. I've got you covered. I'm so powerful I can break rocks with a wind and have an earthquake. I'm very powerful. Then he, and then the enormity of the task. <clears throat> no task is too big for you and God. None. Whatever he tells you to do, some of you have tasks that seem huge to you, but they're not that big to other people. If you have a friend or a mentor or a Christian that's mature, and you have a task facing you, a big decision facing you, go get counsel by people who have been through the war before you. Take advantage of fellowship. Pick up the phone, email, text. Walk, talk to people in class. <clears throat> you are never alone. Never alone. And then finally, quit giving God information that he already knows. Change your prayer life. You don't want, to, you don't want God to, to knock on your door one day and say, hey, what the heck are you doing here? You're not in the right place if God comes to you like that. So anyway, um, that's basically what I wanted you to know. <clears throat> Sometimes being victorious can lead to a, an emotional letdown. Um, and that's okay. That is completely normal. As a matter of fact, let me quote, I'm going to end this talk with a quote from Proverbs 27, 21. It says, uh, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold. I'm sorry. The crucible is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the man who is tested by the praise he sees. In other words, it isn't the defeats that tests the man's character. Sometimes it's the success that tests a man's character. Because the more success and emotional highs they have, the more likely they're going to believe they did it on their own. And all you're setting yourself up for is a great emotional fall into despair. So remember that. Thank God for the bad things that happen to you and the struggles you're going through. But also thanking for the victories and successes you're having, but don't let that go to your head. Just thank Him that it's His grace and His sufficiency either way, whether defeat or victorious. Keep it in perspective. So I hope this has helped you think through how to live a balanced life. And that's what it's all about. It's also encouraging, isn't it, to know that even mighty men of God have their day of despair. So let's take heart and be thankful that God's always there. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. And I pray that if anyone's listening today to this word that, that is in despair, that is exhausted, that feels like they can't go forward, I pray that your spirit would take their eyes off themselves. I pray they would go on a, a weekend trip or take a retreat and just relax, get food and rest, come back fresh. 
And I pray that you would remind them that they're never alone, that your spirit is there and many other believers. People actually might be praying for them, but they have no idea. Lord, don't let the enemy win, just like Elijah, who, who, who got through this and went on to more great victories for you. I pray that'll be true of the people listening to this talk. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, we're going to be back next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about the unseen spiritual battles that are going on all through the creation of the nation of Israel. So I hope you'll join us. Thanks so much.